Okay, in this next section I want to talk to you about UTM zones. UTM is one of the most common projections used in North America. I guess it kind of depends on what state you're in and we can talk about that in a second. But um, for the states that fall within a UTM zone, it's definitely the most common. Why? Because it strives to minimize all the different distortions at once. So whether it's direction, area, um, shape, or distances, UTM projections are so small that they do a great job of minimizing all that distortion. Um, we, have, we were just talking about regional North America equal area conic projections that strive to um, minimize area distortion over a region like North America. But what a UTM zone does is um, it's actually a series of 60 different projections that wrap around the Earth. They're six degrees wide um, so that they're very, very small. Um, UTM, a Universal Transverse Mercator Projection, isn't just one projection, it's actually 60 separate ones. And so you can't calculate across from this zone to this zone. Um, you would use a different coordinate system um, and, and just define it differently. So you can't calculate across these because it's two completely different grids, if that makes sense. I'm located in Utah. Utah happens to fall directly within UTM Zone 12. I also do a lot of work in Minnesota, which mostly falls into UTM Zone 15. There are states that straddle, like Idaho straddles 11 and 12. Uh, maybe it straddles 10 and 11. Uh, anyway, it doesn't fall within one, and they um, don't use the UTM zone. They, in fact, define their own coordinate system and call it the Idaho Transverse Mercator, or the ITM projection. So that does happen too. There are states that are really big and cross a couple of different ones and they end up having to use a completely different coordinate system, um, like state plane, which we can talk about in a little bit. Uh, okay, so that's what a UTM zone looks like. It's kind of why we use them and what we do with them. Um, here is how it breaks down to the United States. Oh, it is 11 and 12 for Idaho. So they have an ITM zone, like I said. Um, these guys are kind of out of luck because they straddle, but there's a straight state plane coordinate system which um, states like this use often. Um, there's just a few of us that really sit right inside one and have it pretty easy. All right, so the advantage is it minimizes most of the distortion that we see with projections. Um, the problem is it only works in small spatial extents. You can't calculate distances in UTM anything from Nevada to Wisconsin. It just doesn't work. You'd have to go to a continental US projection to do something like that. So here's how they're structured. Like I said, they're six degrees wide. Um, Utah falls directly within zone 12. These are the zone numbers here. The central meridian is our origin um, and the equator. So this is our, our northing. We have an easting. This is our, I'm sorry, I just said that totally opposite. This is our easting origin and the equator is our northing origin. So zero at the equator and our easting has a false value of 500,000 meters, and they do that because they don't want to have to deal with negative numbers on the um, western half of the zones. So they give each zone a false easting of 500,000 meters, so that if you have a coordinate easting value of 400,000, you know you are west of the central meridian. If it has a number, an easting value greater than 500,000 meters, then you're east of the central meridian. Um, in North in the northern latitudes, you're going to have positive numbers. They have a separate set of coordinates that go uh, false easting or false northing, I guess, sorry, for the equator in the southern latitudes. So that's how that works. I know that was very um, <laughs> articulate. Sorry about that. Okay, so how does it look in ArcGIS? When you're in Arc and you, uh, let's just bring in any old data here, we can go into the properties in the source tab and learn about the data. So it tells us it's a shape file feature class, it's a point, geometry, this is the location of the spatial data set, because remember it's not stored in the ArcMap doc, it just points to where it's located. And here's our coordinate system. So it's a geographic coordinate system. In this case, it's the uh, World Geodetic Survey of 1984. Units are degrees. We don't have a projection on this data. This is only in a geographic coordinate system. Let's try and bring in another one. Let's see if we can find something that is. Nope, that's also in a geographic coordinate system. I'm going to 
pause for a second. All right, so I did find a city's data set. It's this point file here that does have a projection associated with it. So again, it's a shapefile feature class. It's another point file. But here we've got a projected coordinate system. It's the US contiguous. We're dealing with lower 48 data. Lambert conformal conics, so it's striving to preserve shape, which is fine if you're just doing a you know, visualization. It's telling you that the projection is Lambert conformal conic. Hopefully that's implicit in the coordinate system here. But if we scroll down, we'll see units are meters, which makes sense. It should be planar. It's a flattened surface. But then we see that it also has a geographic coordinate system listed. So the big question is, does it have two coordinate systems? And the answer is no, it doesn't. This is the foundational information. This is how we initially chose to model the curved surface of the Earth using the North American data of 1983. We then applied math to it, this math, focusing on the lower 48 and using um, a conic projection that preserves shape. And we end up with this as our coordinate system. So this city's um, data set has a projected coordinate system that's based on this datum, but this is not the geographic coordinate system for the data anymore. This is the foundation. Does that make sense? The way ARC lays it out is a little bit confusing, but it's important to know that data can only have one coordinate system. Um, the NAD83 datum is a part of this behind the scenes. I hope that makes sense. All right, well, anyway. So when we look in um, the source tab, this is the kind of stuff that we were just looking at. Um, it's a, this is um, a data set that's found in a geo database. It's a polyline feature class. Um, the projected coordinate system is the North American Data 1983 UTM Zone 11. This whole thing is the coordinate system. But we know that this is a datum. We can recognize that. This is a projection. This is the specifics of the projection. The whole thing together defines the coordinate system. It's going to tell us where the origin is. This could be NAT83 UTM Zone 10. It could also be WGS84 UTM Zone 11. There's a lot of combinations that could go on here. The whole thing is absolutely critical to defining the whole coordinate system. Notice again that it shows a geographic coordinate system, but this isn't a two-systemed data set. This has been overwritten and incorporated into a projection, or a projected coordinate system, I should say. All right, so yeah, just know that it's implicit. All projected coordinate systems are based on some datum. They have to be. That's how we model the cur curved surface of the Earth. All right, so when we look at the source tab, I also want you to start getting into the habit of looking at the extent. We can learn a lot about a data set this way. The values are small. They're all below 180, so we can assume from these that unless it's a really funky small data set that's right around the equator, um, that this is angles, and these are units of, in this case, decimal degrees. And that should correlate with a geographic coordinate system down below. If you had units like this, or I should say values like this, and then you had a projection down here, you'd have big trouble. That'd be a pretty weird data set. So you're going to work on this in this lab. What can we say about this data? So looking at the extent and knowing nothing about what the coordinate system is, we can see it's got units meters, so this has to be a projected coordinate system, period. Some datum has been overwritten by math, and it's been turned into a Cartesian grid. It's being measured in linear or planar units. You can also see that we've got great big values. Um, if this were, so we've got hundred thousands here and millions here. This is really typical for a UTM coordinate system with uh, an origin at the equator, and this is our northing, our northernmost and bottom, or I should say northernmost and southernmost um, distances away from the equator are measured here, and then our furthest east and furthest west here. And because they're less than 500,000, if this is a UTM coordinate system, this means we're west of the central meridian. Does that make sense? So if we um, plow through here, we're looking at a NAD27 datum with a UTM zone 12 projection applied to it. And hopefully that makes sense for you guys. This is probably someplace in Utah. All right, that's the bulk of it. That's what I wanted to get through. Um, I do have some more slides in here, just kind of walking through how we start with the Earth. We choose an ellipse. It's not really a choice of a datum, but we choose an ellipse and focus on either a region or a global um, scale that we're going to kind of um, fit to the geoid. And that gives us a datum. 
we're going to construct a graticule, right, and end up with a geographic coordinate system. So we're kind of plotting uh, latitude and longitude on this new modelable surface that we have, and that gives us a geographic coordinate system. We can stop there, collect our data, store our data here, or if we want to do some analysis and display things in a more beautiful way, um, we can choose a projection or math to apply to this, whether it's you know an azimuthal, conic, or cylindrical, grunt um, it through and do the conversions to an arc, a Cartesian grid. Basically take that piece of paper and unroll it and have a nice uniform linear planar system to deal with. And so now we have a projected coordinate system, but it has to go through this process. All right, TSO dots are really kind of a cool demonstration for different coordinate systems. Um, I challenge you to Google TSO dots and look at some of the um, just the, some of the different, especially some of these projections that we're really used to seeing, Mercator, Robinson, or some of the really um, traditionally used global coordinate systems. And I think it's helpful to be able to see on a globe, these dots would all be the exact same shape and size. And so they're a way of demonstrating the kind of distortion that's happening when you um, display things on a flat surface. So like we were talking about the geographic coordinate systems, um, the distance between latitude isn't changing at all, so the spheres aren't getting any taller, but they're stretching because the lines of longitude are being displayed as parallel. It's just kind of a neat tool. Check it out. Um, the other thing you should know about ArcGIS that hopefully you're going to learn in part two of this lab is that um, as long as the data has been assigned the correct coordinate system, like so all data has coordinate values that it was collected in, but you have to tell ArcGIS what coordinate system those values belong to, right? It's all going to depend on where the origins are and if it's geographic or projected. As long as it's originally assigned correctly, ArcGIS can take any, any spatial data that has a known and correct coordinate system and transform it into any other coordinate system and display it differently for you. You're going to get a ton of experience doing that in this lab. Um, that's called on-the-fly projection. The other thing you should know is ArcGIS calls coordinate systems projections. They, they kind of talk about the way they display the data as a projection. So they misuse this word a lot, and I don't want you to get hung up on that. They use the, the phrase projecting on-the-fly. It's really more of a, a mathematical transformation showing one coordinate system in another one without actually changing the data itself but you can permanently transform the coordinate system of a data set using a tool. And that's different than projecting it on the fly. We can use define projection to actually fix an incorrect coordinate system or assign one when one is missing. And then you can use a project tool where if you have a data set that is correctly assigned but you want it to be in a different coordinate system permanently, you can use the project tool to actually permanently change the coordinate system of the data set. Um, that's kind of an important. Um, yeah, so anyway, this is kind of funny. Nat 83, we're not in Kansas anymore. Ha ha. You know, do you get coordinate systems? Are you a total nerd like me? And do you giggle when you see something like this? A, that someone would make a t-shirt out of this. And B, that you actually know what they're talking about. Congratulations. Um, yeah, so these are the slides that I'm going to leave in here that kind of talk uh, to the point of nauseousness about equal area, conformal, equal distant, azimuthal projections, what they mean, where you'd use them. Um, I think there's good information here, but it would be really boring to go through. I think it's easier for you to just read through um, these in particular, where you'd use them, where the exaggeration is greatest, relating it to Tissot dots, conic, azimuthal, um, and that's it. I hope you guys have gotten something out of these. Uh, coordinate systems are really important. If I haven't made that clear, they can be boring and um, difficult to talk about. It's funky terminology, but hang in there and just keep questioning them all the time. When you add new data to your maps, when someone hands you new data, dig in and ask yourself what the coordinate system is. And does it make sense? Do the values make sense? Do you know what the units are? It'll be um, worth it in the long run, I promise. All right, thanks.